Wednesday at half an hour after 11 at night, in a quarter of an hour's time or less, my house at Epworth was burned down to the ground, I hope by accident. That's how Samuel Wesley begins to record the events of February 9th, 1709 in his journal. Samuel has good reason to be suspicious of the fire's origin. He is unpopular as the pastor of Epworth Church. His crops have already been burned. His livestock have been maimed. His house was set on fire one previous time in 1702. And so after being awakened by the fire, he makes his way to his wife's bedroom. In the biblical way of, of saying things, Susanna Wesley is great with child, her 19th child in 21 years of marriage. So I'm thinking he didn't have to stop and ask for directions along the way. So he gets there. And he rescues her and the two oldest children still living at home and gets them out of the house to the garden. And then he goes back in two other times and tries to make his way up the steps to the second floor, and he is driven back by fire. So he runs around to the back of the house, and there he finds two more children and another child, Charles Wesley, in the, in the arms of a maid, and he makes sure they get to the garden. Other children make their own way out, and, and convinced that all of the children are out safely, Samuel makes his way to the garden. And then he hears six-year-old Jackie crying for help from the second-floor nursery. Samuel tries for the third time to go up the steps, and for the third time he is driven back by the flames. Samuel Wesley writes, I thought I had done my duty and went out of the house to that part of my family I had saved in the garden with the killing cry of my child in my ears. I made them all kneel down and we prayed to God to receive his soul. A couple of Samuel Wesley's neighbors tried one different technique. They, they stood on one another's shoulders and made a human ladder, human pyramid to the second floor of the parsonage. And on the second attempt, six-year-old Jackie Wesley jumped out into the arms of a neighbor instantly, just an instant before the thatched roof, the straw roof completely collapsed in flames. Susanna Wesley tells her son Jackie that we know as John, John Wesley, that, that he is a brand plucked from the burning, a branch yanked out of the fire just in time. The image comes from Zechariah chapter 3 verse 2. Susanna was convinced and she convinced John that God had saved him for a noble purpose in his life, a lesson that John takes to heart and applies as he founds the Methodist movement. Our focus for the next few weeks is going to be on story John Wesley, the Wesley way. What can we learn from the life of John Wesley and the beginnings of Methodism that we might apply to our own lives as we try to live into and up to our high calling as we've been rescued to be followers of Jesus Christ in this world? Let's pray about that. God, we thank you for this day, for this time, and, and for John Wesley and Charles Wesley, so many that came before us in the past, for their example of how to live as your followers. May we take their lessons to heart, and may we learn from them what can be learned, that we might live more faithfully in this place and in this time. For it is in the name and in the spirit of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Passage from Romans that Terry read just a few moments ago is a is a very thick passage, a lot of theological density in there, as is much of the book of Romans. The, the theme of righteousness is found throughout the book of Romans, God's righteousness toward humanity and our response in righteousness toward God. This particular passage writes about our righteousness, our right relationship with God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Many folks have, have um, um, cheapened, I want to say, reduced the meaning of being saved to refer to only what happens when we die. And yet, John Wesley, the brand plucked from the burning, believed that salvation is a present tense, here and now reality as future as well. It has to do with healing and wholeness and holiness and justice. All of those words are rooted in in the same word that we translate as being saved. And so that is the biblical definition of salvation, present and future possibilities involved. When we believe with the heart, the very core of our being, the very essence of who we are, 
that God raised Jesus from the dead, we are, are justified. In John Wesley's thinking, we are able to live more just lives because of our faith than we would otherwise, and that we have the capacity to actually live out at a deeper, richer level Jesus' great commandment, to love God with our whole heart and soul and mind and strength and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And as we read on this passage, we begin to discover the depth of God's love for us. In, in Paul's words, there is no distinction in God's love between Jew and Greek. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. And then to what I think is the heart of this passage, three rhetorical questions that build on a word that comes from the previous statement. Paul says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he asks rhetorically, how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And then he picks up on the word belief and he said, how are they to believe in one in whom they have never heard? And then he picks up on heard and says, how are they to call without someone to proclaim him? How is this overwhelming love of God to be known unless you and I make it evident and visible in how we live and in what we say? Leonard Sweet uh, gives one of my favorite definitions of, of a preacher. He says, preachers are story doctors. That we're story doctors, that, that people come to worship with problem stories and, and painful stories, and, and preachers help heal those stories by telling the story of Jesus. And, and by inviting people not to make the story of Jesus part of their lives, the other way around, to make their story a part of Jesus' story and, and their lives, our lives, a part of Jesus' life, the, the ultimate uh, narrative, the ultimate story. Because, as Paul says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved by becoming a part of, of God's story of redemption of the world and and God's intense love, so intense that he sent his one and only son to die and to be raised for us. So it might sound simplistic to, to find our story as a part of God's story. And yet one of the newer kinds of therapy that's developing these days takes very seriously the narrative that shapes our lives, the story we tell ourselves. They call it narrative therapy. And it is based on this premise. We construct a narrative, a story for ourselves, and that's the thread we follow from one day to the next. If we construct a largely positive narrative about ourselves and about life, then when something bad happens or we do something bad, then we see that as an exception to the way things are and to the way um, life is. On the other hand, if we construct a largely negative story, if we tell ourselves a largely negative story, and we do the same bad thing to somebody else or the same bad something happens to us, then we see that as confirmation of the way things are. And it's a whole lot harder to overcome those kind of problems because we, we see it as typical. So narrative therapists help people reauthor or rewrite the story of their lives so they can see problems as exceptions and not the rule to have the confidence and the courage, the spirit to address them. Sounds simplistic, again, doesn't it? And yet, think about the damage that we do to ourselves and others when we tell ourselves these negative stories over and over again. Um, and so when we think about that power, then perhaps we're not surprised to find that, that uh, those people who intentionally try to rewrite, reauthor the story of their lives make significant progress in a short period of time. I think Paul, at a, in, in a, at a level, is talking about that same kind of reauthoring. For those who think that there is distinctions in God's love between groups of people, Paul says there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then he goes on to say, how are they going to call if they haven't heard or if they don't believe? How are they going to believe if they haven't heard? How are they going to hear if you don't tell them? That's sort of the progression that happens in this story. And it is important, obviously, for us to, to proclaim him in lots of ways. As Dave was saying last week, by worshiping God and, and praying and, and telling others, by living the great commandment to love God and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. This week on, on uh, KFES, there was a story about uh, three young people in this community who are answering the call to be story doctors, to be, to be preachers, to go towards ordained ministry. Max Abbott, who's a member of our church, and, and Luke Kinder, and Parker Outman, active in other churches, and yet they have connections. Luke was a part of uh, CODA from kindergarten through fifth grade, sixth grade, and 
and Parker uh, attended our youth meetings on Wednesday night from time to time. And so they are saying yes to go and to help people reauthor their stories as a part of, of the largest, most important narrative of all time, the old, old story that we'll sing about after a while of Jesus and his love. So every Sunday when I stand up here, I try to be keenly aware that, that one of you may have suffered a terrible loss since we worshiped together last or got a call back from the doctor's office that included that word cancer. And yet, um, as if, if we say that war is too important to be left to the generals, uh, story doctoring is much too important to be left to preachers. All of us are called to be story doctors. If each one of us is paying attention we will discover those same kind of stories wherever we are. Maybe the person standing in line with us at the grocery store or the, the person whose cubicle is down the hallway from us at, at work or somebody who works out with us at the same time or, or maybe somebody whose locker is right down the hallway or we're in class with them every day. Someone has, in the last week or so, had terrible situations happen. Maybe they came home to a note that said, uh, I just can't do this anymore. I'm going to have to leave. I'm sorry. Or, or maybe the person you're standing next to in the grocery store is up all night trying to bail a son or a daughter out of, of jail or, or moved here to this town without any support of extended family and friends and is wondering, how am I going to ever make it in a new place? Or, or maybe someone has lost all sense of meaning and value and purpose in life. Each of us in this room has the privilege of being a story doctor, of being a narrative therapist of living and telling the story of Jesus in such a way that others will want to become a part of the story of that, will be, want to see themselves as a part of this great and grandest narrative of all. To use modern language, Susanna Wesley, the mother of Methodism, uh, John and Charles's mother, as well as many other children's mother, was a, a narrative therapist of the highest order. She was a story doctor. Because as she told her son over and over again, you're a brand plucked from the burning. God has saved you for a great purpose. She helped John author the story of his life in such a way that he wanted to do great things for God. She helped John find himself in the greatest story of all time, the story of Jesus. And, and as someone who was saved for a great purpose, you and I have also been saved for a great purpose, the highest calling in life to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to love God with our whole heart and soul and mind and strength and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves and to help ourselves and others reauthor the stories of life, to be story doctors. Make it so, God, for you and for me and for us together. We give you thanks, God, for the old, old story that is never too old, the story of Jesus and his love and, and how that love is overwhelming, overwhelms all distinctions and differences that we try to make between people. Uh, a love that involves and, and is animated by your intense love for creation, sending him to live with us and to die for us and to be raised ahead of us as the first citizen of the new heaven and the new earth. We give you thanks for all of that. Help us, no matter what our stories are, to find them in the midst of that story. For it is in the name and in the spirit of Christ that we pray.